All right, how's everybody doing okay? I hear the first year is a little bit more relaxed, the second year is not so much. <laughs> so Jasmine and I were talking about the importance of, a, of, a, of the slow food movement, and so we're going to pretend this is a slow food meal for you. Guys, so just relax a little bit. and We're just going to share some stories and, and uh, uh, kind of the, the joy of this profession out in, in rural areas. Um, so... Um, and then if you have questions along the way, just chime in. You know, I don't have any real agenda here other than to share some stories with you. So if we don't get through all of this, no worries. Um, all right. So how many are from like a town less than 50,000? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> so most of us um, are, are from more rural areas. So um, I want to just share with you some stories that I experienced, which I think everything I've learned in medicine, I learned from my patients in a small town. And when you're a small town doc, you really have an opportunity to learn about complexity, about what matters in people's lives, and about what happens in their lives, and then how that might result in what they're coming in to see you with. And when I would see my patients in the grocery store, I might see them at church, I might see them at athletic events. You start to develop this insight into what's going on in their lives, which helps you understand what might be causing their headache. And, and that's a gift. Um, it's harder for me to do that here in my clinic because I don't see my patients, my community, it's too large. You know, I see them a little bit, but it's hard to really be a part of that, of that community. So before I get started, my disclosure is I am a tree hugger, um, but is also a really neat opportunity in rural medicine is to really connect with nature a little bit more. Je um, someone asked me uh, why I went into rural medicine, and part of it was not only because I thought I could be of service to an underserved community, but the other thing is I love nature. I love playing around in the mountains. <laughs> I love to fish. I love to go skiing. Uh, and I'll show you why we picked Driggs, Idaho. This is some of the challenges we have, right? <laughs> that we're getting so technology focused in healthcare uh, that we forget about the importance of, probably in rural medicine, this is where we want to be. We want to have access to the technology, but we really need to have good common sense, right? Remember that show, MacGyver? <laughs> that's, that's what we need in rural medicine, is you need really good common sense. You need to have confidence that you can do things that maybe you didn't have a lot of experience in. Uh, and then you also need to know when you need help. And uh, sometimes, even though you know you need help, it's not available. <laughs> so um, we will, uh, but we also want to do more than this, right? Eight years of grade school, four years of high school, four years of college, four years of medical school, four years of internship and residency here take an aspirin. And the beauty about being a rural doc is that you're, you're going to have to do a lot more uh, than just prescribe the aspirin. You actually are, your, your community is asking you to um, understand what they all need to be well. So it's beyond the face-to-face -face visit. So back in the 1950s, there was this um, Life magazine portrayal of the country doctor. This was a doctor in Craig, Colorado, who uh, practiced womb-to-tomb medicine. And he would go from house to house, uh, and he would really be there um, in multiple ways for his patients. We have a lot of role models. This is Dr. Kate. Anybody from Woodruff, Wisconsin? Anybody close to Woodruff? <laughs> yeah? You what? Yeah, she used to come to my practice. Really? Yeah. Did you know her? Um, no, she was not around by the time I was. Yeah. <laughs> She's famous. Yeah. This is Dr. Kate. She was known as the snowshoe doctor. That uh, she would walk around her area and get out to the people's houses who needed her care, deliver babies, treat infections, give them whatever they needed, thanks to a good strong will and snowshoes. <laughs> Dr. Kate. When, uh, she's from Wisconsin, one of the famous rural country doctors. This is another country doctor. I hope you don't have to carry heat. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure why this doctor is carrying heat. Maybe he didn't have really good bedside manner. I don't know. <laughs> um, but this is one of my favorite paintings by uh, Fields. Um, 
And um, Dr. Sir William Osler, one of the fathers of medicine, said it's much more important to know what sort of patient has a disease than what sort of a disease a patient has. And in rural medicine, since you are so intricate in people's lives, you are able to really sit down and experience through a different perspective what's going on. And I would also say that in our environment here, what a great place to learn medicine because we see a lot of zebras that we wouldn't generally see out in rural medicine. So we are able to see a lot of things that give us perspective. But most of health care in this world is not in a tertiary care hospital. Most of it is out into the community. So if we look at 1,000 people, 75 adults reporting an injury, 250 are seen by a physician, nine are admitted to a hospital, and one is seen in our tertiary care subspecialty center. Most of the care is out in the community. And that's why if you want to really create value of your talent, what you learn here, go to an underserved rural area because you can do more good with your talent, your expertise in an underserved area than if you set up shop in an area that's already served well. So um, the thing I love, and it's also the curse of family medicine, is that we love everything, right? <laughs> we uh, are not sub-sub-specialists. We call it, like to call ourselves super generalists. <laughs> that in order to understand the complexity of how our community functions, we need to have a broad perspective. And uh, when I was in rural practice, I still do OB, delivered three babies yesterday. All boys, you know, I don't know what's... Um, but it's fun, it's fun. I, I was just sitting there, that deliveries yesterday, and when that baby comes out, what a gift to be present for that. I mean, talk about beauty, creation of beauty. <laughs> if you just pause and see what happens. And then, I've seen guys cry a lot, but I swear, every single time, the father's bawling worse than the mom. <laughs> it's a meaningful piece. It's a gift to be present for that. So if you want to do delivery, newborn care, pediatrics, adolescents, geriatrics, if you want to do the whole scope of, of medicine, remember medicine comes from the root word med or measure. It, 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 it means a thoughtful act to create order. That's pretty cool. Our culture kind of sees that as a pill, right? That's what our culture has done to the word, but really the word means a thoughtful act to create order. So how might that uh, definition be applied in rural medicine? All right, so after I did my training in Greeley, Colorado, which was a family medicine residency program, focused more on training doctors to go out into rural areas. So we did C-sections, we did endoscopy, we did minor surgeries, I did postpartum tubules, we did appendectomies. So we did a lot of things that I probably wouldn't do here in Madison, Wisconsin, because there's other doctors who do a lot more in those than I do. But when you have a community that doesn't have any of that, that can provide a tremendous service and you can do a lot of good. I uh, can tell you a number of stories. A guy came in with prostate cancer. He wasn't able to pee. His bladder was the size of a basketball. And he was suffering because he couldn't evacuate. He was, he was post-renal and post-renal failure, meaning he couldn't evacuate his urine. His buin and creatinine were going up. He needed a suprapubic cath. I've never done one before. I get the, the thing off our ER shelf and I read the instructions. All right, numb up that area and it's the easiest procedure in the world, you have this catheter with a spear at the end, <laughs> a trocar, and I just numbed them up, <laughs> popped it in there, and <sighs> it was like Old Faithful, man, that urine just. <laughs> and uh, uh, it wasn't that hard. And I provided a service for this suffering man with metastatic prostate cancer where he couldn't pee. So common sense, good training, you can do tremendous things for an underserved population. But I wanted also ski. <laughs> and I loved the environment of Driggs, Idaho. This, we were right on the border of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho, right in this area, Driggs, Idaho. Anybody ever been there? What were you doing there? Um, yeah? We had started out at Jackson Hole. Yeah. Yeah, so Jackson Hole is right. Um, Right here? So you were there. Did, and then you went over the path, the Teton Pass, which is this road, to Teton, Driggs, and, and uh, Tetonia. We were the flat 
flatter side of the Tetons, but this was the, 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 the fault. So if you're on the Wyoming side, it's much more majestic. On the Idaho side, it's much more gradual, also majestic. And they had a 14-bed hospital, and there's a one ad, and they said, hey, we need a doctor. Come practice in Driggs, Idaho. This poor guy was the only doctor, 14-bed hospital. He had to do everything. He had a nurse practitioner and a physician's assistant. So I said, hey, this looks like a pretty cool place. And I want to be a country doctor. So I picked up my wife and three kids, and we went to Driggs, Idaho. Um, and it was gorgeous. I'll show you a few pictures here. And they needed help. It was hard, though. I, I, we're going to talk about it's not all glory, right? It's not easy being on call every other night for five years. That was hard work. <laughs> but when you're on call every other night for five years, you really have uh, the need to create insight into what people need to stay out of the ER. Because you want to sleep, right? <laughs> you you got to survive. You need your sleep. So if you see someone coming into the ER, you go and you say, okay, what do you need to stay out of the ER? Right? In our current medical economic culture, what gets paid? How do we pay? Services, procedure. We call it the pinball effect, right? The patient comes in, ding, 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 and each bumper is a referral or a diagnostic test that has a charge associated with it, right? I didn't want that in Driggs Idaho. <laughs> I wanted to sleep. So we have a different incentive. How can I keep that pinball out of the machine? And it's a different focus. It's really the focus that we're going to have to invest in to improve the value of health care for every town, rural and suburban, is to understand what people need to be healthy and well instead of just how can I get them into this pinball machine. Okay. This is part of the challenge here. If you want to really be of service, we talked about this already, go to an underserved place that has no doctors or has limited doctors or doesn't have enough doctors. If you go to an underserved place where there's not many inputs of care, you can, you can create tremendous benefit in that town. Okay? Now let's say this happened in Jackson, Wyoming, because everybody wanted to live over the pass in Jackson, Wyoming. They had 40 beds. Guess how many doctors they had in their 40-bed hospital? They had more doctors than hospital beds. They had 54 doctors. And they had about 30 orthopedic surgeons. Now, each of these doctors bought a pretty nice house. <laughs> and the houses aren't cheap in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Now, even if I'm the most well-intentioned orthopedic surgeon, uh, I gotta pay my mortgage. I gotta put my kids through college. I gotta put food on the table. And I know surgery. Even though, so consciously I may not be intending to do this, but subconsciously, if I gotta pay for that mortgage, I might be doing unnecessary procedures. And that's why we see if we have too many doctors who focus on disease care, right? There's a difference between health care and disease care. If I focus just on the disease, and we need that, don't get me wrong. <laughs> That's the thing I loved about rural medicine is I could do both. And I love doing both. But if our system focuses so much as on disease and we have more disease doctors, the more doctors we add over a certain threshold actually causes harm to the community because we're focused on disease instead of health. Now, if I have more doctors that focus on health and keeping people out of the pinball machine, that might be different. But we're training people to focus so much on disease. The more disease care we have, the more we're going to see billboards saying, come to us for your chest pain. Right? It's right out here. <laughs> Instead of understanding what's at the root of that chest pain, how can I prevent the chest pain, how can we focus on nutrition and some of these other things, what impact does that have? So, Here's some of the fun things about it. And chime in. Again, we're, I don't need to be yapping at you the whole time. So if you have any questions, chime in. Please. If you liked it, why did you leave? <laughs> so the question was, if I liked it, why did I leave? I wanted to teach. I wanted to look under the hood first before I went and taught. Because you know, you got to get out there and get your hands dirty a little bit, I think, before you actually teach someone how to do this. So. I thought, five years in a rural area, that's great training. 
That's really something that will give me better knowledge or insight to understand how I might influence someone else to really appreciate the importance of this. So I wanted to teach, and I knew I wouldn't be there forever. And it was hard work. Being on call every other night for five years wasn't easy. <laughs> But we had a great nurse practitioner, we had a good physician's assistant, and then we worked them into the call schedule. So even though I had to be by the phone every other night, I didn't have to actually be on call but every four nights, because there was four of us. So it, it was okay, and I took a day off a week. That was my skiing day, <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I'll show you the ski hill. Uh, but I took a day off. I would often work the weekends, but there was always a day off for respite where my partners would cover for me, and that was kind of my my rekindling of my energy. <laughs> All right. So this is where we move to. Um, this is the Snake River. Anybody like to fly fish? No? No one? <laughs> Bass fish? Yeah, there we go. We got a couple. This is the best trout fish fishing in the world, but the fish are really smart. That was, was a bummer. This is our town. <laughs> this is our town. This is our ski hill, the Grand Targhee. These are the Teton Mountains. We built a house right here, which I'll show you. And another nice thing we'll talk about in rural medicine is your money goes a lot longer, farther. I could never afford a house we built in Driggs, Idaho, here in Madison, Wisconsin. But this is a cool place to live. <laughs> There's a lot of diversity. These are all potato farms out in here. Instead of spring break, we had potato harvest. You know, because we needed to stop school so that everybody could help harvest the potatoes. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen. These are the Teton Mountains. This is the road up to our ski hill. And uh, we had a, a snow machine. In, in the West, they're called snow machines. Here, they call them snowmobiles. And actually, I was able to write my snow machine off as a tax write-off because we got so much snow up there that I had to ride that into the hospital to deliver babies which was really fun, you know? I, it was, I can remember like it was yesterday. <sighs> this is rural medicine, boy. I'm, a, I'm, I'm going over the drifts on the way to the hospital. Oh, my gosh, that was fun. Um, and generally, you know, I, we lived in an area um, that was very LDS Mormon, and they had a lot of babies, and they knew how to do it, and they often didn't need me. <laughs> So sometimes I didn't make it, and everything turned out fine. This is Grand Targhee. Anybody ski? Did you ski Grand Targhee when you were there? Uh, Grand Targhee is over the pass from Jackson, Wyoming, and it was a place where the clouds would just get stuck. So we also called it Grand Foggy uh, because it, it, it had a tendency to hold on to clouds, and that's why we got so much snow. But it, it's some of the best powder skiing in the world. Uh, in Grand Targhee, and I was the medical director because I was only one of two doctors and my partner didn't ski. <laughs> so I was the medical director, and uh, as the medical director, I could ski free, and I got a buddy pass. So on Tuesdays, my day off, I would take a buddy of mine and we'd go up and go skiing. And I had to carry a radio, so every once in a while I had to go and relocate a shoulder. We did it right there on the hill. Let me tell you how to do it real quick. It's real fun. So you get a sheet, right? Let's say it's this arm that's dislocated. You get a sheet, you put it under this arm, and you hold on to it. So you're holding on to it. And then I take your arm, and I just lean back. But you have to relax, right? So you're, you're providing counter pressure, and I'm, I'm coming down, and then I talk to you, right? I try and distract you. Yeah, you know, so how was that air you got before you laid it on your shoulder, you know? And then... <laughs> And then you slowly, this is simple, you just slowly come up. And then right about here, if you're, you gotta pull hard, <laughs> you gotta pull hard, you feel the clunk, and it goes back in. Okay? Pretty simple. You should do an x-ray, make sure they don't, didn't have a chip fracture of the humerus, but most don't. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun to do those things, right? Uh, because it, 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 it was also a lot of fun, which I'll show you to take care of things like acute MI in our, our emergency room. Uh, it, it was fun, but not always, because not everybody does well. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit, too. This is our town. This, this is looking the other way. This is looking, this is looking um, west. No, east. This is looking east, and this is looking west. 
uh, the big whole mountains were on the other side. Uh, and these were where everybody did their hunting and snow machining, because you weren't allowed to do that in the national forest. So we had a public forest and a national forest. So it was a nice opportunity for recreation. This is our town. And um, this was our little 14-bed hospital. Two physicians, one nurse practitioner, one physician's assistant, the best nursing staff in the world, a great lab and x-ray. And it, I appreciated what a, a group of an interdisciplinary team of professionals can do for a community who work together. And it was nice, because my partner and I would just trade off every year being chief of staff. Right? <laughs> All right, you do it this year, I'll do it next year. And we could do things like, we, one day we just sat down, OK, let's start a pet therapy program. We didn't have to go through all the rigmarole, because it's just us. <laughs> so when people were admitted to the hospital, we'd encourage them not to stay there forever, but encourage them to bring their pets in. And they would hold them in bed with them. Sure, we had to clean up some poop once in a while, but that happens. You deliver a baby, you're dealing with a lot of poop. <laughs> you know, it's OK. Don't have to worry so much. But that's a nice thing about rural medicine, is that we get so focused on fear Right? Oh, I'm going to get sued for this in this big hospital. In a rural hospital, you can use your common sense and say, what benefit will this pet have versus the potential for harm? And if you have that relationship with your patients, they're not going to sue you because they know you meant well. They know you meant well. This was our house. We bought five acres right at the base of the Teton Mountains. I was right out of residency. I had a lot of debt, but we built a house. That was another thing. I said, oh, I built my dream house. Why did I leave? It's my dream house in the mountains. I loved it. But I left because I wanted to teach. It's interesting. That which gives our life meaning and purpose, that which we focus our life's goals on, it trumps all the material things by far. You know, we left. <laughs> a gorgeous environment, our dream house. We went, and back, went back to school. We did a two-year fellowship in integrative medicine from there. This is Jim Schumacher and his family. They live up in St. Germain. Anybody from St. Germain? Been there. <laughs> it's a nice place. They got great cross-country skiing, great bike paths, uh, great lakes. Uh, he was a country doctor up there. This was his backyard when I went and visited him last summer. And uh, we went canoeing in his backyard. <laughs> it's pretty nice. Pretty nice. What's that? Have you? Yeah. <laughs> but it really, you know, the cost of that house is about the median, you know, 300 and some thousand dollars. You know, uh, it's hard to find a house like that in Madison, Wisconsin. But I'm just telling you these things because they're, they're part of our lives, you know? We're not in this for the money. <laughs> Believe me, you don't get to rule medicine for the money. You go in for the relationships and the opportunity to really be of service. That is pretty cool. Um, we also had the freedom to do things. We had the freedom to create pet therapy in our hospital. I did C-sections, me and my partner. We did about 40, uh, each of us did about 40 deliveries a year. And um, our C-section rate, guess what the national C-section rate is now? I couldn't believe it. 32%. Vaginal bypass, 32%. My gosh, 32%. Ours was 8%. Mainly because we had all these great doulas <laughs> working with moms to help get the baby out. It's interesting, in the research with doulas, women doulas work well, but men doulas don't work so well. <laughs> interesting, I'm not sure why that is. Um, so I did about... I did about eight C-sections. My partner did about eight C-sections. So we did about 16 C-sections a year, not a lot. But without that, we wouldn't have been able to provide OB care at all in our community because we, we felt like we had to be able to provide C-sections in order to provide OB care. We had a nurse anesthetist come over from Jackson, Wyoming, and we had to call them. So we kind of had to predict the high-risk ones, you know. All right, Joe, you better come over. I have a bad feeling about this. <laughs> Often I would do that. Not a lot of evidence. I just have a bad feeling about this. Come over and just be here. And often he came over unnecessarily, but he was there. So if we needed to do a C-section, he could put in the epidural and we could do it. That was fun. I didn't have any major complications, probably because I didn't do enough. 
But we did the training. We felt competent. We had a surgeon back us, backing us up, also from Jackson, Wyoming. So we had a team. And it was fun. Now, sometimes it's a little bit too exciting. <laughs> it was a little unnerving, always realizing that if something major happened in our town, we were it. We were responsible for that. Um, this was one of those cases. This is uh, a patient of mine. He, um, and all the pictures I'm showing you of patients, they've given me permission. Actually, I'll have them cut them out of the video just to protect their privacy. But uh, um, this was a patient of mine, and he had some challenges in regards to mental health, bipolar disease, alcoholism, and he'd been doing really well. I delivered three of his kids. I did his vasectomy. He'd been doing really well, and then he fell off the wagon, and he started to drink again, and he started to lose connection with his family because they couldn't put up with it anymore. And he started to drink, and he went to his um, family's house, who they asked him to leave, and he went back, and he had a gun, and um, he pointed the gun at the police, mainly as an attempt for suicide, because they knew they were going to fill him with bullets, right? So he pointed the gun at the police, came into my ER, and this is my patient. I knew him well. <laughs> he actually said, hey, doc, <laughs> right before I intubated him. And I put a chest tube in him because he had a gunshot wound on the right chest. He's still living. I don't think he's in Driggs, Idaho anymore. Uh, he might be back there. Uh, but this is a little scary. You know, you're asked to do things that often um, are a little unnerving. I had another uh, case, and this was a, a challenging one. I'll tell you some of the challenging. Ooh, well, maybe I won't tell you that one. If you guys want to hear more about some interesting gunshot wounds, <laughs> there's, uh, uh, there's plenty of stories about that. This is a 45-year-old patient. He was my neighbor. He had three young kids. And uh, this is a good example of don't trust the computer. <laughs> if you see this EKG come in to your ER, this is what we call tombstone ST elevation. Doesn't that look like a tombstone? Right over the leads V2 and V3. What are leads V2 and V3 right over? In the AV node, right? So you're going to lose electrical rhythm. You're going to more likely die of an arrhythmia, and you're going to lose your pump. You don't want tombstone elevation anteriorly. That's right over your left anterior descending artery, OK? We don't call it tombstone elevation for nothing. People rarely live through this. He came in, classic substernal chest pain, had the Levine sign, right? We, I started the heparin, gave him the aspirin, beta blockers. At that time, we were given lidocaine. We don't give lidocaine anymore, and I gave him thrombolytics, TPA. His pain went away. But then once you reperfuse the heart, you get reperfusion arrhythmias, and you start to get into VTAC. So, we treated that with the beta blockers and the lidocaine. He made it. We called the helicopter. We got him into the helicopter. He was alive. Three days later, he died of an aneurysm. He had such a severe injury to his anterior wall that it weakened the, the muscle of the heart, and he blew out the anterior wall, and he died. Had to go tell his wife and three kids. It's not easy. Sometimes in this work, you actually have to turn towards suffering. It's not an easy thing to do, right? You have to actually turn towards it. But I would encourage you that if you're brave enough to turn towards suffering, it's really rewarding because you touch on what is really needed. You touch on that authenticity, that process, that if we just ignore it, it's going to come out in some dysfunctional way. And that's not easy. But I wasn't just prescribing aspirin either. This is one of my favorite cases. This guy came in. I had a medical student working with me from the University of Washington. And uh, he came in, and this is the history I got. He woke up like this. And he's, he's, he's red, red as a beet. He's salivating, right? And he couldn't, he was choking. So Mad Hatter, salivation, you think hydrocarbon poisoning, right? He ingested something. So I had the medical student go to their house. They only lived two blocks away. Grab everything that he could have ingested and bring it back. So the medical student runs out. <laughs> it was the funniest. It was really helpful. 
comes back like this. Because <laughs> I got no history. He woke up like this, right? And his name was Zach. And I said, Zach, you had to take something. What was it? And we go in the box that the medical student bring in, and we bring out this raid. <laughs> Did you take this? No. We, we go to the armor all. Did you take this? No. And in the, in the meantime, <coughs> I thought he was going to die on me, and I had no history whatsoever. And I'm, I'm turning over, looking through the box with the medical students, saying, what could it have been? What could it have been? And he was so cute. And he said, well, I ate a little dirt today. <laughs> you know, he's trying to help us out, right? <laughs> he was trying. And we're over here looking in the box, and all of a sudden we hear this, <coughs> And he threw up this little toy horse in the emesis tray. And I've never been so relieved in my life that he fell asleep sucking on this horse. He'd forgotten. And it lodged in his esophagus. <laughs> Always think foreign body. <laughs> Always. And I'd never been so relieved. I thought I was going to lose this little five-year-old. And thank God he took care of himself. <laughs> his body figured it out. It doesn't always pop up like that. This was not a patient of mine, but I think it's kind of a fun slide. What's, what's the differential of these three dots on the kid's nose? Got bit. That's a good one. Yeah, you've probably seen that before. <laughs> I know, but he, he bounced back pretty good. Kids are resilient, right? <laughs> He's no worse for the wear. Yeah. All right. This is a little challenge. We've talked about this a little bit already. You're all alone. I would love to be able to consult the cardiologist many times. I'd love to be able to consult the surgeon. I'd love to have their help, but they're not around. We had a grant for telemedicine. Well, I was able to call University of Washington and get a specialist on the computer, but back then, the, the computers were so slow, it'd be like a five-minute delay. <laughs> you know, it really wasn't functional. Uh, now, in small towns, they're bringing in these little robots where you have the screen, and then you have the specialist in Salt Lake City who's there in the screen. So that might not be bad if you have a nurse or someone holding the hand, <laughs> giving that human connection, while you get the expertise from the specialist in another town. We, our, our radiologist was in uh, uh, two hours away but we were able to, to send our CT scans to his home. And he'd get up at 2 AM, go down to his living room, and read the scans for us. So with technology, we're really going to be able to do this better. And you're not going to be so isolated. You can't help but have your friends as your patients. This is good and bad. This is a good friend of mine. He broke wild Mustangs. <laughs> and these are Mustangs aren't real tall. And he'd take me riding up to. Um, a falls in Yellowstone, and we'd go, and you know, I'm kind of tall, and these horses were like pony size, <laughs> these Mustangs, you know, I'm like this, you know, gonna, and, uh, but he had eosinophilic fasciitis, um, and it's interesting that this broke out when his family lost his farm. This autoimmune disease really flared when their family lost their farm. That's the beauty of being a rural doc. You understand the complexity of people's lives, and you understand why that might have triggered an autoimmune disease, that stress. Why did the body start to attack itself when we suffered that I had to let go of a farm that was in my family for generations? That tells us a lot about the complexity of this thing we live in. This is a medical student from University of Washington. We went fishing. <laughs> he went into ear, nose, and throat. I don't take it personally. <laughs> I'm sure he's doing a lot of good work. Uh, but uh, we had a fishing guide service on the, on the um, Teton River. And they'd have to train their guides. So the, the owner of the fishing service said, hey, Dave, we've got to train some guides. You want to come over? And I said, sure. So we got a free fishing trip. And we just had to play, you know, not patient, but, you know, client, which was a lot of fun. This is Gizmo. Um, let me stop with Gizmo, and then we'll open up for questions, because we only have 15 minutes left, and you guys have to run off. Gizmo, um, have I told you about Gizmo in any other lecture? Yeah? OK. Maybe I'll skip. Yeah? All right, well, 
Gizmo was known as our town Santa Claus. And he had stage three heart failure, where I had to give him so many drugs to increase his cardiac output. Second years have a test on that, right, cardiology? So we're increasing his ionotropic, um, or his, uh, yeah, his cardiac output, the ability of his heart to uh, push out blood, had him on a bunch of drugs. But he still would get short of breath walking from this end of the room to that end of the room, except on our Christmas Day parade, he would dress up as good old Saint Nick. And he loved this. He looked forward to this. This gave his life meaning and purpose every year, where he would get his donkey, he would throw a pack of toys over his shoulder, and he would hand them out to the kids on the side of the road. And I would sit there on the side of the road with my family and my kids, and I'd watch Gizmo walk from one end of our town. We didn't have a stoplight even, so it wasn't a real big town, but it was about five blocks. And I would watch him walk from one end of our town to the other end of our town without any shortness of breath at all. And I knew the function of his heart was really poor. And I knew he should be on the side of the road in forward pulmonary edema panting. But what was it about that once a year parade that gave his life meaning and purpose that trumped all the drugs I could give him? What a great lesson I learned in rural medicine. Patients give you stuff. <laughs> when I left, uh, this woman gave me huckleberry jam. This is good stuff. People would find the huckleberry patches in the Teton Mountains, and they wouldn't tell anybody because they'd be so sacred. Just them and the bears, right? <laughs> they would put it in their wills, but only for their family. So if you're able to find the huckleberry, it was like gold. And when I left Idaho, she brought me this jar of, of huckleberry jam, which is like the equivalent of 500 bucks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like gold. She also knew I was going to go learn about complementary and alternative therapy, so she brought me the salve that she made from a, a weed in the woods that um, uh, she said cured everything. So I tried it. Yeah, it worked pretty good, but who knows. <laughs> I had another patient. It wasn't this patient, but this age, 82 years old, and she was an artist. Maybe I've shown you this picture, too, but it's my favorite gift I've ever received from a patient. And um, she was an artist, and she would paint things, and she would sell them in arts and crafts fairs across Idaho and make a killing. You know, this 82-year-old woman. She didn't look much different than her, but that wasn't her. And uh, when I left, she gave my wife and I a sample of her artwork. And let me preface this. It has no meaning whatsoever. <laughs> but this 82-year-old woman would make a killing painting underwear. <laughs> and she gave me this fruit of the loom before I left Riggs, Idaho. She gave my wife one that was even too risque to share with you. <laughs> she was 82 years old. I want to be like her, man. I mean, talk about health. She exuded it. And she would have so much fun selling this underwear at all these arts and craft shows across. I, I loved her. I still have it in my underwear drawer. I don't wear it very much. <laughs> this is not in rural medicine. I took this of a patient last week. Her name's Lynn. She has end stage multiple sclerosis. She's in a wheelchair here. She can hardly move her arms. She had a stroke six months ago that it affected Brokaw's area, so she had an expressive aphasia. She couldn't talk. She couldn't express. She couldn't call this a pointer. She couldn't call this a microphone because she lost that part of her brain. I went and saw her at Capital Lakes. We did some first grade flashcards. What's this? It's a p -p pen. We had to retrain her. I was expecting her to pass. I didn't think she was going to make it. This was a pretty bad stroke. But something wonderful happened in Capital Lakes Nursing Home. She fell in love with this Frenchman. We should all be so lucky to fall in love with a Frenchman. <laughs> and the transformation that happened in this woman was just unbelievable. Look at her. She looks wonderful. Now, we don't want to attach all our happiness on love, right? Once we attach our happiness on something outside of ourselves, on someone or something, a relationship, we're kind of lost, right? Because there's that, that uh, impermanence that, that never lasts. But this is a great opportunity to see that beauty inside each of us. And that's something I, I found in rural medicine was 
I felt like a hypocrite one day just prescribing a bunch of drugs when I knew they needed something much more deeper than what I was trained to give. And I can't define it. Come to the Healer's Art Elective. We'll, we'll try and at least touch on it, but no one's going to define it. But you know there's some beauty there that does more than anything that we could prescribe, but we can be a part of it. We can open up the doors to that process. So I'm going to start there with Lynn and Miguel. <laughs> this was just last week. Still makes me smile. It'll make me smile for a long time. All right, questions. We have nine minutes. <laughs> 